Some of you may remember in the prior week we studied the parable of the uh, ten virgins. This week we'll study Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 to 30, which is the parable of the talents. Parables, as we know, are earthly stories of everyday life employed by Jesus to convey a deeper heavenly truth in a relatable manner, facilitating deeper understanding for his listeners. Like the parable of the ten virgins, the main point of the parable of the talents is that Jesus wants us to be ready for his second coming. The expectation is one of anticipation and preparation. If the parable of the ten virgins draws our attention to waiting faith, the focus of the parable of the talents seems to shift to serving faith. One commentator says, together the two parables <clears throat> depict the balance of looking forward to his coming through anticipatory preparedness and looking forward to his coming through faithful service. In the parable of the talents, Jesus describes a wealthy master who gives varying monetary amounts to his servants before departing on a long journey for a vacation or business trip. Three servants were given a measure of the master's wealth and property for safekeeping and managing it in proportion to their ability. When the master returned, he evaluated the performance of each of his servant. With this as a background, let us begin in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one triune God who dwells in glory, we come before you with open hearts and attentive minds. We ask for clearing of all distractions as we engage with your word. Thank you for your gift of love, sending to us Jesus Christ. We're also thankful for the gift of your word. We pray that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, and we would not just hear your word, but also be faithful doers of your word, being ready, making use of good talents that you have entrusted to us while anticipating joyfully your second coming. May your word speak to us today, inspiring and motivating us to live according to your will. May your word take root in us and bear fruit in our lives. In the name of Jesus we pray, Amen. Today's message is entitled, You Got Talent. Please open your Bible, if you have it with you, to Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, and follow along. Hear the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to, an, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He re who received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, 
good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This passage is a testament to the inerrant and infallible word of God. There are four characters in this parable. The master is Jesus, who's going away to prepare a place for us and coming again to receive us. There are also servants, servant one, servant two, and servant three. We all fit into one of the three types of servants that Jesus is talking about. Jesus has entrusted his talents to us while he is away. And there are three points to this passage. Because Jesus is the master, number one, we the servants are called to faithfully manage the talents he has entrusted to us. Number two, where there is no risk for God, there will be no reward from God. And number three, there is no excuse for poor stewardship. So the first point, because Jesus is the master, we the servants are called to faithfully manage the talents he has entrusted to us. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus describes a man, the master, traveling to a far country. The master calls his servants and entrusts his goods to them. The master doesn't say how long he's going to be away. He's just traveling. In the first century, masters would often give their servants great responsibility. These responsibilities were often related to money and financial investments, which is on loan from the master. This speaks to the Christian principle of stewardship. Everything we have, including our skills, our intellect, free will, time, and abilities, are gifts from God. The master does not tell the servants what to do with the talents. One commentator says, the best thing a master could do with his money in his absence was to divide it among selected slaves and leave them to do their best with it. This parable takes up the question which that of the bridesmaids left unanswered. What is readiness? Brothers and sisters, while Jesus is away, we are called to work faithfully, to work diligently, 
to know our work is going to be either extravagantly, extravagantly rewarded or severely judged. The greatest opportunity in human life is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to know him and glorify him with our life, to experience the forgiveness of sin, to experience the presence of his life in our life. And we become partakers through the gospel and through Jesus of eternal life. In verse 15, the master gives five talents to one servant and two talents to another servant and one talent to a third servant. A talent was not an exceptional ability, like singing a top 10, writing a bestseller, or painting a masterpiece. Although this parable is not specifically about this kind of talent, it does have application to our abilities. Instead, in this parable and the rest of scripture, a talent is a, a unit of measurement. Barclay, a commentator, commentator, says, the talent was not a coin, it was a weight. A talent was a weight of approximately 75 pounds. Its value depended on whether the coinage was copper, gold, or silver. But of course, the Greek talaton is simply a sum of money. In Jesus' day, a single talent of silver was worth about 6,000 denarii. If a talent was worth 6,000 denarii, that is equivalent to a day laborer working 20 years of wages. The English use of the word talent is for a natural or supernatural aptitude, and that derives from this parable. Brothers and sisters, in the application of this parable, it is appropriate to see these talents as resources of time, money, abilities, possessions, authority, position, and influence. The question is, are you and I using our God-given talents for the glory of God and for the advancement of his kingdom? Who, he who has the gift of teaching, let him teach. Who, he who has the gift of preaching, let him preach. He who has the gift of generosity, let him be generous. We are all gifted by the Holy Spirit for ministry. However, the most important thing is not your gift. The most important thing is your faithfulness in the use of the God gift, God-given gift. See, the master is careful to entrust only certain amounts of his talents to those individuals who he knows can handle the responsibility. Each servant was given a different amount of talent according to his ability. The master is honoring each individual with what they could successfully handle. Some people get passed over for promotions and they get mad and they complain. If someone is not qualified or does not have the proper skill set or the job is beyond their ability to handle successfully, then actually it's a merciful thing to pass someone over for someone else. To entrust a high level of responsibility to someone who lacks a skill set or lacks a job qualification or lacks the temperament or the desire would only set that individual up for failure. This is not showing preference. This is showing deference. You are respecting the individual <clears throat> for what he or she is able to properly handle, and you're recognizing that in order that they might be the most successful in that position. Although one servant only received one talent, 
we should still see that this was still a significant amount. Some received more, but it, is, but it is important to recognize everyone received something. A commentator says, the talent which each man has suits his own state best. And it is only pride and insanity which led him to desire and envy the graces and talents of another. Five talents would be too much for some men, and one talent would be too little. Second point, because Jesus is the master, where there is no risk for God, there will be no reward from God. In verses 16 to 18, the servant who received five talents and the servant who received two talents from the master went at once and traded their talents and earned more talents. Trading the talents makes these two servants sound like they were playing the stock market. We're not told how they traded with their talents. They may have loaned the money at interest. They may have used the money to buy investments and sell them for more money. Whatever it may be, the point is that these servants used the talents they were entrusted with to gain more talents. Notice the servants did not take a cut for themselves. The servants see all of the talents belonging to the master and they give it all back to the master. These first two servants had commonality. They did their work promptly, they did their work with perseverance, and they did their work with success. Note their success is not in the greatness of their work, but rather in their faithfulness of their work. They were ready to give an account to their master. They both acknowledge the master's grace. They both acknowledge the master's gift. In contrast to these first two servants, the third servant who received one talent did almost nothing with his master's money. He took some care that it would not be lost by digging a hole and hiding the talent in there, but he did nothing positive with his master's money. The moment the third servant stuck his master's talent in the dirt, he made the decision that he was going to live his life on his own plans and purposes. He was not going to use the resources that the master entrusted him. He made a conscious decision to live his life absence his master's concerns without his master's resources. In verses 19 to 23, after a long time, the master of those servants came back and he settled accounts with each of his servants. The long delay may have tempted the servants to think that they would never have to give an account for their management. However, there is a day we must all give an account. Brothers and sisters, are you laboring in prayer, laboring in giving, laboring in love, laboring in visitation, laboring in evangelism? Are you laboring in sharing the gospel in order to expand the master's kingdom? When, not if, but when Jesus comes back, we will all have to give an accounting. Note for both the first servant who received five talents and the second servant who received two talents, the reward was the same, despite the number of talents entrusted to them. Each servant performed the same, doubled the number of talents, according to the resources they received. Both servants received the same commendation from their master. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Can you imagine what it will look like for Jesus to look you into the eye and say, I know you. Well done, good and faithful servant. In verse 23, the master tells these first two servants to enter into the joy of their master. There is a place of joy belonging to the master of these servants, and they're invited to join the master in that place. The fullness of joy is there because their master is there. Believers experience joy because of the presence of the Lord. There is a sense of heaven as the destiny for these two faithful servants. In verses 24 and 25, we come to the climax of this parable. <clears throat> the servant who received and buried the one talent had nothing but excuses and accusations against his master. Notice that the master judges each of the servant individually. If they were taken as a group, they did very well. Eight talents given and 15 talents returned. Yet each one was judged on their individual faithfulness. Charles Spurgeon says, Remember that in the day of judgment, thy account must be personal. God will not ask you what your church did. Instead, he will ask you what you did yourself. This third servant, who merely buried his talent, made an excuse and accusation against his master because of his master's great power. The third servant says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown. One commentator expressed the thinking of this third servant as, I can do very little. It will not make much difference if I do nothing. I shall not be missed. My tiny push is not needed to turn the scale. Another commentator says, It is the genius of wicked men to lay their blame of their miscarriage upon others oftentimes upon God himself. In verse 25, the third servant says to the master, Here, you have what is yours. His statement makes him seem proud and at the same time afraid. Because the master was so powerful, the servant felt that the master didn't need his help. The servant was afraid to take a risk the third servant thought that the master would be pleased that, that he did not lose the talent and could say, here, you have what is yours. This servant had no idea how much he had displeased, displeased his master. This servant did not understand that he could not grow what the master entrusted him without taking risks. The risks had to be wise, calculated risks. The only silver lining with the third servant's excuse is that he still understood that what he had been given belongs to his master. He said, you have what is yours. Third and last point, because Jesus is the master, there is no excuse for poor stewardship. In verses 26 to 30, the third servant is judged. The master calls the third servant wicked and lazy. Others have added that this third servant was indolent, unenterprising, timid, slothful, suspicious, heartless, spiritless, and idle. The third servant had a job to do, and he did not do it. He knew what the master wanted, but he still decided not to do what the master wanted. This third servant fears not just using the talent, but losing the talent. He feared that he might lose what God had given to him, so he hides it. 
He would not use it to build and grow the master's resources and the kingdom. The sovereignty of the master never excused the wickedness and laziness of the servant. The plight of the third unprofitable servant is the same plight as the foolish virgins of the previous parable. Those who do not work for the Lord, nor pray for others, nor evangelize, because God is sovereign, condemn themselves by their wickedness and their laziness. There is no fruit of the faith for these types of people. By their actions or lack of action, they show that they are like the wicked servant in this parable. They don't know their master's heart at all. This third servant had an unfitting fear of risk and failure. A different starting point, one talent, is, a never, is never an excuse for a lack of stewardship. Just because we do not have what others have doesn't mean we are responsible for what we do have. Let me read that again. Just because we do not have what others have doesn't mean we are not responsible for what we do have. In verse 27, the master responds to the third servant's excuses by saying, So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. This third servant could have done something with what he had. If he, even if he had not doubled it, like the first two servants, the talent would have gained some interest for the master's money. Brothers and sisters, if you are not going to do what God has called you to do, you should at least find someone else who will do what God wants done. You don't want to pray? Then find someone who will pray. You don't want to evangelize? Then find someone who will evangelize. Charles Spurgeon says, If we cannot trade directly and personally on our Lord's account, if we have not the skill nor the craft to manage a society or an enterprise for him, we may at least contribute to what others are doing and join our capital to theirs so that by some means our master may have the interests to which he is entitled. In verse 29, For to everyone who has... More will be given, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. There are those who have gifts like the third servant with one talent, but hold them in such a way that it is as if they have nothing. These individuals will find what they had will be taken away. Brothers and sisters, if we fail to use the gift gifts God entrusts to us, we will lose it to another. In contrast, those who hold and use what they have received as faithful men and women, to them more will be given. When you steward well with what God has given to you, that good stewardship unlocks the doors to more responsibility. The faithful and responsible will be given more and the unfaithful and disobedient will lose what little they have. Stewardship is about the increase and in productivity, about walking in divine authority. Stewardship is recognizing everything in your possession belongs to God. It is all His. When we use what He has entrusted to us, He will entrust us with more. In verse 30, the master casts the unprofitable third servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These sufferings, weeping and gnashing of teeth, are idioms that refer to hell. The third servant was lazy and wicked, and he demonstrated that he was not a true servant 
of his master. The third servant rejects the talent that the master gave him. There are consequences and eternal significance to the third servant's actions. It is fitting that he and those who show the same heart will be cast forever out of the master's presence. Just as there was a sense of heaven in the destiny for the first two servants, the first two faithful servants, there's a strong sense of hell in the destiny of the wicked and lazy servant. The harsh truth is that we all were unprofitable servants. Without the grace of God, we could not produce anything. Verse 30 begs the question, what is the most valuable talent that Jesus has left with us, wanting us to cherish and to duplicate? I believe that gift is of salvation. It's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ dying for our sins and giving us salvation for, soul, for our souls who, for whoever believes and receives. Matthew 28, verses 19, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples. Is Jesus talking about discipling with other? Is talking about duplicating with others what we have received from Jesus as the most precious talent ever given, our salvation. In the larger context of Matthew chapter 25, the, mo- the main point of this parable is clear. Our readiness for Jesus' return is determined by our stewardship of the resources that he has given us for the sake of sharing the gospel. We have to be faithful with the talent God has given to us. We bloom where we are planted. We serve where we are deployed. There's a poem I came across. It goes like this. There was a very cautious man who never laughed or played. He never risked. He never tried. He never sang or prayed. And when one day he passed away, his insurance was denied For since he never really lived, they claimed he never died. You've been entrusted with stewardship in the master's resources in the master's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, let me leave you with some questions. What are you doing with the talents our master has entrusted you? It's not a matter of quantity. It's a matter of faithfulness. What are you doing with your knowledge, your time, your money, your abilities? The sins of omission, what we don't do, may ultimately be more dangerous than the sins of commission, what we do. With that, with that let us close in prayer. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, we thank you for your word and you have blessed us with the most precious commodity ever given, the gift of salvation. You've called us to be good stewards of everything you've entrusted to us, especially the good news of the gospel so we may share share it for your glory so it may be duplicated in the lives of other people. Help us to be faithful stewards of what you have entrusted us and where you have called us. We eagerly look forward to your coming again because your return is the hope of the church and for us individually. Forgive us, for we do not always remember these things in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We are sinners and we need you. We, we love you. We praise you. And may our chief end always be to glorify you forever and ever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.